Oputari, on the east coast of the Coromandel Peninsula, a rare, unspoiled estuary in those parts, flanked by two great power sites. It's one of those places where the historical imprint is very visible on the land. Do you feel that the past is very close to the present? It was here that the writer Michael King made his last home, a place he loved, a place where past and present seem to coexist. People who don't know where they've come from don't know where they are and they don't know where they're going. And New Zealanders have got to be coerced, if you like, into learning and understanding more about their history. Early in 2004, riding high on the runaway success of his Penguin History of New Zealand and his defeat of a life-threatening cancer, King agreed to take part in a documentary about his life and work. I'm curious about my curiosity, he said. He was also planning to write a memoir and doubtless to continue giving wise advice to a nation increasingly keen for clues about itself in troubled times. But none of this was to be. On March 30, just an hour from their home, Michael King and his wife Maria were killed instantly when their car drifted off the road and into a tree. It's a strange day when the death of an historian stops a nation in its tracks and makes it mourn his loss and mark it with a state memorial service. Like many other New Zealanders, I received the news of the deaths of Michael King and Maria Jonkowska on the morning of the last day in March. It happened that I was about to begin the ceremony that acknowledges the recipients of the 2004 New Year Honours. The loss of Dr. King and his wife was so untimely, but of such importance to all of us, that even at that time of celebration, I felt it appropriate to share it with the honours recipients. And as I did, a great sigh, almost a groan, filled the room. This was indeed a moment of shared shock and mourning. I think everyone who will remember where they were, how they first heard this news. So many people have said it to me. It was an ineradicable moment. Mm. I said, I beg your pardon. Am I to understand that Michael King has died? And she said, yes, I'm sorry. She said, I thought you knew. I hadn't heard the news bulletin. And I was absolutely shattered. Uh, so I started to weep and I went back into uh, the, the room, the annex that the tribunal has for morning tea. And I announced in Māori, uh, we are, in life we are in the midst of death. The death of Michael King was front page, top of the broadcast news, just as his penguin history was in the process of selling itself into publishing history. Kiwis of all shapes, ages and shades had just spent their summer buying and reading the book that told our story to us. It was a job that King had spent more than 30 years doing, explaining us to ourselves, bringing our past into our present, helping us see the bigger picture. He knew there was comfort in history and he had known that from an early age. Michael's father, Lewis, married Eleanor in 1939, served as a naval officer and went on to found a successful advertising agency. Michael was the second of four children. 
they had an almost ideal New Zealand childhood. When I was six years old, we moved to Parramatta, then a rural village on the northern arm of Porirua Harbour. Our cottage was right on the beach, within feet of the water at high tide. We looked across the estuary to Walker's Farm, site of the suburb of Camborne. At that time, however, we could see no other houses, no people, no sign of recent human activity. And yet the harbour had been occupied on and off for nearly a thousand years. For Michael, the ages 6 to 12 spent there were very special years and he loved the sense of freedom that he had in being able to go out in the dinghy and go fishing and discovering the natural world around him but also the history of the area. My father had given him books like um, The Coming of the Māori and he explored the military barracks and found buttons and he looked at the old whaling station and found some whale bones, and he enjoyed talking to the older people in the area who knew about the history as well. So from a very early age, he had a sense of the place he was in and what had happened previously there, and he wanted to know the stories. Mike and I as children were quite different. I was very much into playing with my dinky toys. Michael was really interested in the environment around about when he first stumbled on the fact that the peninsula that we lived in or on had in fact housed Maori at, at certain times over the years then he was anxious to actually find Maori middens um, he believed and took me one day that he'd actually found the cave where Te Rapraha had um, in fact hidden at one point when he was being pursued by the English so right from the very beginning there was an interest in history people and what life had been like On hot days, my mother would pick us up in her Fiat convertible in the afternoon and take us for a swim at Plymouthton. Those six impressionable years generated in me a relationship with the sea, a love of wildlife and a passion for New Zealand history. And all these were to remain with me wherever I lived subsequently. Breaking the idyllic spell came a first taste of the bad health that would dog him all his life when young Michael became one of New Zealand's last polio kids, spending six months in hospital. By the time Michael and his busy brain reached high school, boarding at St Patrick's Silverstream, he was hungry for knowledge. It's very teachable, and when I was teaching history in the upper 60, I was, uh, I, I loved the writing of A.J.P. Taylor, who, who had a, a very sort of journalistic style of writing. Very straightforward, plain, but sort of pithy, and particularly at the end of paragraphs, sort of sum up what the paragraph said. And this is what I tried to inculcate into these boys. And he couldn't get it for a while. I remember one time there he, he wrote this essay where he tried to write really well. And, and I put on, in, on the essays, Michael, avoid cliches like the plague. And he came up to me very seriously afterwards and said, uh, Sir, isn't that a cliche? And I said, OK, well, that, you know, no more jokes. But he then got that sort of style as you see in this history book, in all his writing actually, that, that was a style of sort of H.A.P. Taylorish, quite informed, quite factual, but very elegant and flowing and, and good narrative. And, and with this sort of the ability to make the piffy sort of comment, and I realised that he was a boy of some talent when in one of the essays on the 19th century on Gladstone, uh, he came up with a, with a terrific line, which I thought was really good for a, for a boy in the sixth form. He said, Bi uh, Gladstone's Bible was the Bible, and which I thought was fantastic. When he hit the University at Victoria in Wellington, King was a fully formed, fully opinionated performer, running with the smart crowd. He was one of those people around the campus that everybody knew about. You know, he was, he was on the exec, 
um, right, right here in front of the Hunter building, about uh, 50 yards away, they always used to have a, a sort of forum where people would stand up at lunchtime and spout their ideas. And I can remember uh, Michael taking part in that kind of forum. He was totally passionate about his history, and unusually, he was passionate about New Zealand history. The basic tradition of history in New Zealand was that history was something that happened overseas. You know, New Zealand didn't have any history. That the essence of history was learning about the great achievements of the British Empire and of the British race. It wasn't put quite like that, but that essentially what it was. And that essentially what you were designed to do was to become part of the kind of imperial ruling class. And uh, so the idea that this place uh, might have history and might have an interesting and unusual history, that simply wasn't current at this point in time. Michael King already knew better than that, and little did he know it, but he was about to step into another world, a place so deep in its own history it would take his breath away. By the late 60s, Michael King was in his early 20s, married to Ros Henry with a baby son, Jonathan, and in search of a career that might blend his love of words and history with the need to earn an income. In fact, the door to the rest of his working life was about to open. In 1968, fresh from the University of Waikato, I joined the Waikato Times. I'd always wanted to write, and if possible, to earn a living from writing. I also wanted an antidote to five years spent among academics and students. The Waikato Times was unusual for a provincial newspaper of the day, not reactionary at all. In fact, liberal enough to fill its newsroom with young graduates. King found himself mastering the cut and thrust of journalism with print stars of the future like Judy McGregor. When he came to the Waikato Times, he covered garden shows and, you know, um, duck diseases on Hamilton Lake and all sorts of other issues, like the rest of us. But then the Waikato Times needed a Māori correspondent, and Michael became it, and as a consequence developed extremely strong relationships with the Tainui people, and began a sort of reporting that the Waikato Times and probably New Zealand journalism hadn't seen before. Traditionally, reporters with the Māori around took a Pākehā approach to that other world. But King didn't see things that way. This was a defining time for the young reporter with his love of the past. Within only a few weeks, he found a completely new world. Uh, running parallel with White Hamilton was the world of the Kingitanga of Tainui. He was a journalist uh, who was different from most journalists in that obviously he immersed himself in amongst the people with, uh, with the Tainui and so he uh, was a Pākehī who managed to have the inside track at Māori Hui and I think that's what really made him uh, a journalist uh, as a journalist with a difference. King had developed a fascination with the dying art of moko. He convinced the paper to let him write a series on the old women, the kuya, before they and the tradition died. He was told there were only 12 left alive in the country. In fact, travelling back country North Island roads nearly every weekend for three years, I found over 70 of them. 26 with chisel moko, 45 with the later needle tattoo. They lived in dirt floor fodder in bush settlements, in farm cottages, in suburban houses made from Huntley brick, in rest homes, in hospital wards. King managed to have many of the Kuya photographed, even getting them onto the front page of the paper. The project grew to the point where he felt there was a book to be written, and he approached freelance photographer Marty Friedlander. He said to me, I want to photograph these women, Marty, because most of them are in the 80s, 90s, even one is over 100, and they're going to disappear, and it would just be just awful if we didn't get a record. 
And this was about really recording these wonderful women before they died. Who was the first woman that you photographed? Is she here? First woman is this woman that uh, Michael is with. That's the, the Naha, very, very yes. old. Yes, yeah. the very old woman. And she was so remarkably sprightly, amazing woman and cooperative. And um, no problem with her. Michael was very gentle with her, he sat with her, and uh, uh, she loved being photographed. I mean, that's the one thing I do have to stress about this whole enterprise. There wasn't resistance from any of the women. Now, whether that was because Michael had done his homework so well, or whether it was because it was, as he always says, it was this woman-to-woman -woman thing, they just responded to another woman photographing them. But there was no resistance. King and Friedlander spent an intense 10 days on the road together photographing the women. Within a year of the book being published, many of the kuya would be gone. Friedlander became aware of King's career ambitions. I felt that even on this trip, photographing Moko, that I was with someone who was single-minded in his commitment. This was his chosen ambition, and he wanted to be a writer, and he wanted to be a historian. But writing the book wasn't the hardest part of the task. Getting it published was. King suffered rejection before Moko finally made print a fate suffered by another young writer. What actually drew me to him in the first place was that we had both uh, been rejected by the same publisher on the same day. <laughs> Myself for a collection of short stories called Ponamu Ponamu, and I think Michael for um, a book called Moko. And the irony about that is that, uh, you know, we were rejected for both the same reasons, and that was that uh, our books uh, were possibly, you know, uh, because they were for a Māori market, um, they were probably, uh, you know, not sellable. Mōkō was well received, but publishers weren't exactly knocking down his door for more. It was a turning point, though. King decided that, while newspaper journalism paid the bills, what he really wanted was to be a full-time freelance writer. King's next project was groundbreaking. A television series on Maori culture called Tangata Whenua. Instigated by John O'Shea of Pacific Films and directed by Barry Barclay, the series set out to let Maori talk about their own culture in their own way. It was radical stuff. There are only about 30 queers with moko left in the whole country now. Will it make a difference to the life of Maori communities when these queers have gone? It would. It would because that's our only connection with the, with the past. Mm. The cameraman on Tangata Whenua was Keith Hawke. Barry explained it was going to be done in a Maori style. It wasn't going to be done as uh, the way we'd produce traditional documentaries up until then. The intention was that we would go in and, and let them talk and, and follow the story the way that they wanted it followed. He was accustomed to going into marae meeting houses and villages and being prepared to spend days making contacts, waiting for people, drinking tea, just being part of the, the group. Whereas if you're working with a film crew, um, days cost money and you really have to have you know, things have to happen and, and you've got to work to a schedule. And it was, I think it was, that was part of the, the difference of working with Michael to working with other people. We had to cross the harbour to get to the place that meant most to the old lady. It was Pātikiro, the Bay of a Hundred Flounders. When you watch the Tangata Whenua series, uh, which was a series that I also became involved in, what uh, you realise these many years later is how classic a piece of work it is, how crucial and significant uh, it is uh, in terms of what it did. What's that thing up there? That is the tomb to Tuiwa Mitakaraka, an ancestor of the old lady. and. Uh, 
you would see the cracks in the earth believed to be the removal of all the mana when the people left. For the first time, a Pākehā negotiator, a Pākehā narrator, a Pākehā observer was going into Māori country. And because of that, uh, you see all of these wonderful people, Herepo, for instance, farewelling um, her dead child. He opened up a window on, on the Māori reality in a non-threatening way and that's why I was pleased when I saw those programs, uh, the Tangata Whenua series. Um, and in a way I think he was pioneering the media to move in that direction. So he was a, a game breaker in a way. King's next book would be a major, his first biography and the result of time spent with Tai Nui. It was a virtual commission from Tai Nui, a biography of Princess Tapuia. The story was a gift, a powerful, charismatic Maori woman leader, an icon to a people virtually unknown to Pākehā. Shown here in rare footage with some of the hundred orphans she brought up, Tapuia Herangi is regarded by some as the most influential woman in our political history. But her story was untold, and the witnesses, like the Kuia with the Mokul, were dying out. Her tangi was one of the largest ever seen in New Zealand. 12,000 people attended over a week, and on the day of burial, the cortege was five kilometres long. King had a strong feeling for this story. I said that, well, maybe it's time, maybe it was time that something should be done. And uh, then, of course, when we talked it over and agreed that, yes, that Michael should uh, be allowed to write this book, then we had all the reaction from the Māori, uh, uh, Māori writers. And then I, I decided that uh, I think we could get more from s s a Pākehā writer, because a Māori would be more too sensitive about some of the things and they wouldn't want it printed. And when I come to think of it today, it's just as well we did it at that time, while those people were still with us. Because today we probably wouldn't have known half those things that were eventually written in that book. No, the, Michael was able to, to, uh, to really uh, feel, to write how the people felt. And because they trusted him, they opened up to him. King had the raw material for the book that would immediately define him and his work for the next decade. In 1970, Michael King, wife Roz, and children Jonathan and Rachel moved to Parramatta, where they lived in his beloved old family home on the water's edge. To buy the time to put the finishing touches to his biography of Tapuia, he took a paying job, teaching journalism at Wellington Poly, where he met Christine Cole Catley, who would become a lifelong friend. He was one of the most stimulating colleagues possible. And as far as teaching goes, uh, 
marvellous because he wasn't very much older than many of our kids. You see, the 50 students we had, and uh, they really liked that. It was from the end of the 60s, early 70s, they were golden days in journalism. They were golden days too at Parramatta, where King found himself living in a creative little community alongside the likes of poet Sam Hunt. He felt the continuity of his own life here. In 1976, King won the Catherine Mansfield Award, which allowed him to finish his Tapuia biography with the perspective of distance in Monton, France. When the book was published, it was a huge critical success, establishing King as an historical biographer. King's old friend, Jock Phillips, was asked to review Tapuia for the listener. So I did review it, and I said in the course of it, I thought that um, what he'd really done is, you know, changed the direction of New Zealand history and suddenly brought someone who was not well known to most Pākehā at all and made her a central figure in New Zealand history and that from now on New Zealand history wouldn't be the same. Well, I wasn't to realise, but this sparked off quite an intense correspondence in the listener, uh, led particularly by Professor Sid Mead at Victoria University, who argued that, you know, this was outrageous really to, to, to suggest that this biography was important or that it was important to Pākehā, that this was an important Māori biography and it should be written by Māori. And so it was the first kind of explicit uh, occasion when uh, there was a real argument that Michael shouldn't play a role in the recovery of Māori history. For King, it was the beginning of a battle which would eventually see him pull back from writing about Māori. We actually attacked uh, Kingitanga about the decision um, to have a Pākehā do that study of that very important woman in our history. And uh, Michael got upset about that. Um, the attack, though, wasn't on him. I mean, in a way, he was almost irrelevant to the argument that we were having, which was one about Tino Rangatiratanga. Despite this, King was on a roll, writing history for the average New Zealander. In the space of only four years, there were six books, among them Tehe Māori Ora and New Zealanders at War. But he was barely earning enough to get by on. A certain amount of commercial success was now increasingly necessary in the complicated life of the now separated father of two and full-time writer. He survived. He survived financially as a freelance historian, and that was an extraordinary thing. He complained often at how little money he made, and he made remarkably little. There were one or two books that did well in the early days, but, but they still only made him a few thousand dollars. So the occasional literary award helped and the occasional grant helped, but it was very tough going. Determined to support himself by writing, King was forced to become prolific. Words equaled wages. It's often said, perhaps slightly unkindly, that Michael was prolific, and the, the connotation is that he was too prolific. How come a man as able as he had to churn out so much, so much of the other, the, 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 the other kinds of books? And the reason simply is that he had to produce an income. The other crushing reality of life for the flat-out writer was his health. After the childhood polio came something that, for someone as driven as King, was very hard to cope with. 
both he and I were teaching the same big group of uh, young Māori, mostly in their 20s and so on, who were trying to get into journalism. And Michael was teaching them, I was in the Marlborough Sounds, and he rang me and croakily said, look, I've got a peculiar flu I don't seem to be able to get rid of. Do you think you could come up and take over till I get better? Well, he didn't get better, and I got smitten by the same thing. And it turned out we were both diagnosed as having uh, ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis, which trips off the tongue, or the chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, I myself lost about five years of my life when my brain was so curdled I could just manage perhaps to publish one book a year or so. Michael was even worse affected than I was. Sometimes he had to go to bed for days on end. He found that he worked best in the morning and sometimes he'd get up quite early in the morning and so we'd know not to ring him sort of before 11 o'clock because once he was on a roll with something I think a lot of people don't appreciate that he would spend up to five years writing a book and if he had other deadlines book reviews and things as well sometimes the health did make it difficult for him to complete things on time. In 1983 King's Maori, a photographic and social history, won the prestigious Watties Book Award. But his ride through Maori history was about to become rougher, a little rougher than he was quite ready for. Now there were new winds blowing in Maoridom, and for Michael King, chronicler of Maori history, they were chilly ones. King was wounded, but he wasn't finished with Maori biography, and this time his subject was living and something of a living legend. Michael King was hard at work on his second major Maori biography. This time, though, his subject was very much alive and kicking. This land is ours. We Stick the pofenua in the ground. And we say, this land is ours. And the redoubtable Finna Cooper was keen to have his story told. <laughs> Pangaru in the far north was the elderly activist's home patch. So this is the house that Michael came to to visit Dame Finna? Yeah, on a couple of occasions, I, I can remember, but we lived up the road and um, she had, um, he had come there, I think, more than twice. Mm. And um, we had this enormous big house, the old school building, and uh, we lived in it. And, um, you know, it was, it was wonderful. He could come and be relaxed and she would be relaxed and, um, and they could get the interviews over and done with too. Yeah. When he did come initially to seek the, the um, Dame Finna to uh, see if she would agree to it, um, she was a little bit apprehensive at the time, but um, after a little while she got quite used to him, got quite comfortable with him, so uh, he was able to um, say anything and um, she would understand. Finna Cooper was a formidable matriarch a seasoned campaigner, then in the 90s, and no softy. The King's sure touch with old people didn't fail him, even with the mother of the nation. Were there any worries about the fact that he was Pākehā doing this story? No, uh, well, when, when you say Pākehā, I think he was very much Māori. <laughs> in his manner, he was very much Māori, uh, because he felt it inside him, you know, in his heart because of the researching that he had done and um, the truth came out and he was in a lot of, well, my eyes particularly, he was more Māori than Pākehā. There were some people that um, were suspicious of a story being written, um, like particularly about the land march. A lot of people felt that she was a puppet of the government of the day. I don't think so. But it, it was her style, and uh, she loved the Pākehā, apart from the injustice to the Māori, but she still loved the races, the mingling of the races. Mm. 
Because she once told Michael that she told her people that if we can't beat them, we will marry them. This is what she said. Well, I just wanted you to have a quick look at it now, just so you can see. Oh, that's a book. That's the book. Not everyone thought the book of the life of Finna Cooper was a wonderful oh. idea. Well, I have a very strong personal um, view about Finna, which isn't shared by the myth makers, of whom I think in regard to uh, Finna, Michael may have been one. But it's also uh, an acknowledgement in saying that, that she was a, a great talker and that she could convince many people that um, what she was saying was what she believed, uh, that her portrayal of, of her life was as she said it had been, and neither of those things was necessarily true. But Michael did, I think, an excellent job in presenting one side of her. Um, the other might need to be presented, or maybe it's better left unwritten. I don't think that book is as good as the Tapuya book, because basically it's Finna by Finna. <laughs> um, and he was criticised again by Sid Jackson uh, for daring to write things about Māori. And there is a, a kind of a, a myth abroad that uh, Pākehs who write books on Māori uh, are doing it for money, to make money. Well, you don't get rich writing books. Ten years ago when I started writing about Māori history, I was invited to do so uh, by Māori informants. The accusation then in fact was that Pākehā writers were not doing this sufficiently. Now the feeling is that Māoris want to and ought to take control of their own culture and control its presentation and Pākehā writers are not as welcome in the field. So in response to that I, I've been withdrawing. If no one's writing the books then it is valid for a person like Michael King to write the books until Māori produce their own scholars and we're short of scholars because Māori are belatedly getting into the academic world just now. Uh, there were so few of us. I think that it's true that for a very large part of New Zealand history, Pākehā have written the script about how race relations are to be conducted in New Zealand, and now that whole situation is under renegotiation, if you like. Māoris are saying, OK, if Pākehā want to enact with us, that's fine, but we are going to write the ground rules. And that's really the process that's going on at the moment. Though strangely, it wasn't just a minefield for Pākehā. He did step back. I also stepped back as well for a different reason because I stopped writing for 10 years because I was getting it in the neck too from young Māori writers who were saying, oh, you know, you're writing too fast, um, you're taking away all the story, you're, you know, you're becoming too big a, um, an impact on, on the, the, um, the, the literary scene. So I stepped back. I think he was hurt by the backlash. I think that he felt that he was writing both for Māori and for Pākehā, and I think he felt that it was as important for Pākehā, Pākehā like me, you know, to learn about the contributions of, of someone like Tapuya or Fina Cooper, as it was for Māori to, 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 to know about it. When King stepped back, he actively encouraged Māori writers to take his place. Back in the early 80s, I was working on a book about a South Island prophet called Tamai Haroa, and I'd kind of approached it independently. I didn't realise that Michael was involved, but partway through the project, he got in touch with me. I think he'd been talking to my mother to find out where I was, and um, just said, when he found out that I was, I was Māori, and uh, that I was quite serious about what I was doing, he said, well, you know, I'm quite happy to step aside on this project. I think it was around about the time he was getting a bit of stick from other Māori about him being a Pākehā, writing about Māori history, and so it was part of that whole idea, I think, that he had to encourage Māori to write their own history. What did you think about that encounter? Because that seems a very magnanimous attitude. Well, I thought it was pretty magnanimous, that's true. And, uh, of course, Michael already had a reputation, so you know, I was a bit awed that somebody thought that um, I, had the, uh, I had the wherewithal to do the job and, and do a good job on that. So 
That was very encouraging for me, and I thought that, um, you know, in, in a way, Michael became my mentor in history, if you like. King's creative response to all this hoo-ha was to write his most personal and political book, Being Pākehā, in which he floated the idea of a Ngāti Pākehā, a white tribe. This book, Being Pākehā, published in the mid-80s, was a real trailblazer. Um, he was exasperated with people who thought that Pākehā was a derogatory term. For him, Pākehā was a very positive term and a very literal, a literal explanation of what it meant to be a white-skinned New Zealander with a long association here. In his view, white-skinned New Zealanders, Pākehā, were as legitimate a local tribe as Māori. They displayed characteristics that made them completely different from the Europeans, where they'd come from. And he produced very significant work in this area, and I think taught us a hell of a lot. He was trying to find markers, trying to find ways, you know, like um, Māori sovereignty is now a, you know, a buzzword. White native, he was trying to find, a, you know, a, a comparable way of saying that we were within the, in the same frame a Māori native, white native, but we did actually belong to the same tribe. So what he was trying to do was to create the sense of defining, but defining it within <laughs> Māori terminology. After being Pākehā, King drifted. He wrote Death of the Rainbow Warrior, which was a return to straight journalism. There were awards, grants, and even some royalties, enough to keep food in the fridge and petrol in the tank. And there was something big coming, something that would take King to another place altogether, a land apart. Michael King's next project would take him 900 kilometres offshore to the Chatham Islands, for 700 years home to the Moriori, a people virtually wiped out in 1835 after an invasion by dispossessed Taranaki Māori. The total of men who died, 735. Those killed, 118. The women who died in despair, 601. Those killed and eaten, 108. Grand total, 1,562. Tommy Solomon, the last full-blooded Moriori of a people who once numbered nearly 2,000, was buried in 1933. From the same part of the Eastern Pacific as Māori, the Moriori had, in their isolation, developed a unique pacifist culture, quite different from the warlike New Zealand Māori. I'd now like to call on Prime Minister of New Zealand, the Right Honourable David Longy, to unveil the staff. In 1986, Tommy Solomon's family erected a statue in honour of the last full-blooded Moriori. Of the full blood are gone forever. And as they were dying, they passed out of history and into legend. Muriri were not a myth. They were in these islands a real people. We can't make them live again, but all we can do is to say honestly what happened in the past so that our actions in the present are not guided by falsehood, but by truth. More importantly, they now wanted a definitive history to be written, 
a history that would smash the myths that have been built up over the last 150 years. Maui Solomon, the grandson of Tommy, approached Michael King to write that history. So we discussed what was happening in terms of the statue unveiling, and um, Michael um, said he was really keen and enthusiastic, but he would reserve his decision until after he'd been to the Chathams and had had an opportunity to speak with some of the Moriori elders and the people on the island. And uh, so he came down to the island in December 86, time of the unveiling. Thanks very much for the for a very exciting three days. Oh, it's been great having you down here. Yeah. Okay, see you later. It was around that time when he was being criticised by some as a Pākehā for writing Māori histories. And, um, you know, I said to Michael, look, uh, my family and my people have decided that we think you're the person to write our history, so we're asking you personally, and uh, we'll make sure that there's a, a disclaimer in the book um, that and make it known to the wider audience that we have asked you and you have our full support and backing. One of the reasons why I accepted the invitation from Moriori people to write this book is because of the vast misunderstanding on the mainland of who the Moriori were or whether or not they even existed. There were these old myths that they were dark-skinned people here before the Māori, they were dull-witted and the more enterprising Māori wiped them out and the remnants fled to the Chathams and the last one died in 1933. Well, all that's nonsense. It was a very socially level culture. They didn't have aristocrats, commoners and slaves the way that Māori culture did, they just had elders and everybody else was of equal status and the elders were really first among equals. They were a non-combative, non-martial people. They didn't believe in group fighting. If they had a dispute to settle, it was settled with single hand-to-hand -hand combat and as soon as blood was drawn, that was it. Over the next several years, King made many trips to the Chathams, talking to Moriori descendants and researching all known historical sources about this misunderstood people. It wasn't long before he'd fallen under the considerable spell of the place. Few Moriori knew anything of their history, Alf Priest's experience was a common one. We knew that my family had Moriori ancestry, and uh, what what I didn't know is how or you know how that had come about. Um, but generally, in, in my younger years, we we grew up here in a community whereby we were very much one people, and um, that's what we were taught. And it took quite some time. Um, to sort of find out that that wasn't, you know, we were quite distinctly different as far as our heritage was concerned. Other members of the Priest family had similar experiences, but the Tommy Solomon Memorial and Michael King's research sparked a new and powerful reaction. Where it all happened for me was in 1988, we, uh, we went to a meeting here on the island and uh, one of the Moriori's got up to speak and they were told to sit down. You, you've got no rights, you know, to uh, be speaking. Uh, you're at the bottom of the list, sort of thing. And I don't know, uh, that really hurt me. And I, well, I just had enough, perhaps, culture in me to, to know that that wasn't the right thing to say. So uh, I thought, I, th I thought of my... <coughs> My ancestors straight away, I thought, well, if I'm going to sit here and take that crap, what would my ancestors think? So I walked out of that meeting, and, uh, and uh, that evening I rang uh, all the Moriaries that I could think of on the island. And the next day, we had a meeting with, you know, seven or eight people. And uh, it sort of started from there, and we had meetings, and we had meetings, and we had meetings, and it sort of snowballed. Uh, and all of a sudden, Michael King 
came onto the scene. He was here on the island. And we invited him to one of these meetings here. As far as I was concerned, he was the teacher and I was the pupil. He knew more about my culture uh, than what I did. And Michael kept on coming over to the island and he, he kept coming here. <coughs> and he, uh, he, uh, every time he came, he gave us strength. Michael King's book, Moriori, A People Rediscovered, was published in 1989 and had a profound impact. King's work became a cornerstone in the revival of a people that history had all but lost, and his research evidence in a Moriori case taken to the Waitangi Tribunal four years later. I think a lot of the Moriori people were astounded at what they found in the book. And a lot of Moriori people who didn't know they were even Moriori, I think, when they read the book, realised who they were. And, and when they came back to the island for the Waitangi Tribunal, many of them, when they gave their evidence, and many were in tears too, saying for the first time in their lives they were proud to stand and say they were Moriori in public. We have spent the last 20 years rebuilding our identity, rediscovering our identity, and most importantly, finding out where all the various strands of our people ended up. Because as, as evident from Michael's book, um, you know, there were people taken as slaves to the Auckland Islands. There were people traded, our people traded as slaves in Taranaki. Some escaped with the Korte up to the east coast of New Zealand. And um, there was a, sort of a diaspora of Moriori all over New Zealand. And many were brought up as Maori, and they were ashamed of their Moriori side, so they never mentioned it. There was this negative stigma associated with being Moriori. And so that's been part of the process of um, sort of raising, uplifting our people. And now our people are, you know, people are, are coming forward to identify with Moriori because now they're proud of it. The renaissance of Moriori continues apace. A marae has been built in the Chathams. And when it opens early in 2005, a picture of Michael and Maria will take pride of place. In 20 years, Moriori have travelled back from obscurity and claimed their culture. You know, Michael really is, uh, you know, really one of the founding fathers of the renaissance of uh, Moriori history and culture, without a doubt. As was typical of King, his passion for people and place didn't die when his project was complete. He returned to guide tourist groups and to work with photographer Robin Morrison to write another history of the Chathams, A Land Apart. But ahead lay a new path, one that would see King return to writing biography, though this time of a pair of New Zealand's literary giants. By the 1990s, Michael King was a writer in search of new stories to tell. Burned by the backlash from some corners of Māoridom to his early books, and buoyed by the heartfelt response to his myth-breaking Moriori book, he was experiencing trouble setting his compass for the path ahead. King's home life, though, was an island of sanity and support now happily married to book editor Maria Jungowska and living in one of his favourite parts of New Zealand, the Coromandel, King had put his roots down deeply. They met through a writer's workshop that Maria did. She came into Michael's life at a time when his health was not good. He had ME and she nurtured and cared for him. And through various health problems, post-polio syndrome and diabetes before the cancer. They protected one another and cared for one another and supported one another. Michael and Maria were, were a couple who were perfectly suited. Um, they were both passionate about living in paradise. 
on the edge of the estuary. She was very supportive of him. She played quite an editorial role in his work, greater, I think, actually, than he let on. I'd be, I'd be very surprised if Maria didn't see everything that he wrote. Their home on the inlet at Oputari became the centre of King's universe. He'd always been a little in love with the Coromandel, now he really connected. In 1993, he published a kind of love story to the place with his book, The Coromandel, in partnership again with photographer Robin Morrison, who was himself by this time ill with the cancer that would kill him a year later. I don't think New Zealand has had another documentary photographer as good as Robin or better than Robin. Yes, I'd like to get a few more shots around here because I find this really interesting here. His pictures are looked at because they're interesting, they're almost compulsive, but at the same time there's a huge range of comment there about what kind of people they are, about what kind of community they're living in, even about what their state of mind is, their state of soul, if you like, because Robin is drawn towards certain kinds of people in certain kinds of situations. And his pictures speak volumes. Looks like something out of Hansel and Gretel. Well, it is. We'll tell about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For a few years, King even enthusiastically guided buses of history-minded tourists around his favourite places and people on the peninsula, often dropping in unexpectedly. When he gets along the coast there and he, um, he rings up and he says, Good, you're home. I said, why? What's the matter? <laughs> he says, can you put the kettle on? I said, OK, thinking that it's just him, you know. And then he said, I've got a busload. <laughs> I said, that's OK. And, um, yeah, it was just lovely the way he turns up with all these people from overseas, tourists, you know. Yeah, there was just something about Michael. I loved him like, like, like part of my family. You know, I really got to know him. King was in search of new stories to tell, not Maori, not his own, but of his own people. Now his subjects would be writers. He set off in doing these major biographies of Frank Sargis and, and, um, and Janet Frame. But the interesting thing about those books is they're wonderfully rich in terms of the social setting of the writers, um, and they're very, very scholarly and accurate and interesting and well-written histories, but they don't actually tell us very much about the writing, because Michael in the end wasn't a literary critic, and he's quite open that these are biographies of writers rather than exploration of their writing. First, King tackled the life of the great gay uncle of New Zealand fiction, Frank Sargison. King had met the then 74-year-old literary legend in the late 70s and saw him off and on until Sargison's death in 1982. King had a strong sense of the history and mythology of New Zealand literature, and in 1995, when he published his next major biography, it was of Frank Sargison. Frank Sargison was a great New Zealand writer, but he wasn't just a great New Zealand writer, he was a great New Zealander. And he was one of the people who articulated the process by which we went from being British people to being New Zealand people, still with connections to our culture of origin, but with a voice of our own and with a path of our own to follow. Then, five years later, came Wrestling with the Angel, his biography of Janet Frame, who was, like Finna Cooper before her, alive and still quite lively at the time of publication. Her doctor at the Maudsley Hospital in London put it this way, that Janet doesn't have the social skin that most of us have to enable us to interact with people without anxiety. Oh, Michael! Oh, Janet! <laughs> Janet Frame 
who in a sense is already better known through her life than through her writings, became even more known through her life, through, writers bio through Michael's biography, than through, um, than through her writings. And in some sense, I, I, I sort of felt that uh, moving into literary biography uh, was a little bit of a waste of his, of his great talents. I mean, you know, they're, 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 they're wonderful books. I don't want to get, get me wrong about that. But I'm not sure that they're quite, they're not quite the major achievements, in my view, as a historian to those early Māori histories. As the new millennium began to unroll, a major project was coming King's Way. A book that would sum up what he'd spent 30 years accumulating. It would be the biggest hit of his career, and it would be the last thing he'd ever publish. At a putri on the Coromandel, that place where past and present intersect so, Michael King was in his prime and working on his biggest project yet. There was time to connect with family and try to connect them with this place that meant so much to him and wife Maria. But the old bad health bulletin had terrible news. Maria had multiple sclerosis. For King, the news was even worse a virulent cancer of the throat. I'm going into it in good heart, uh, the treatment that is, full of hope, uh, and with every hope and expectation of being a cancer survivor. Even if I do survive, I'm still not going to lose that feeling I have now that every day is a gift, and that's a precious feeling to have. He was very brave. Uh, his first thought was often for those around him, for his family, more than himself. He was deeply concerned about Maria, who had MS and was deteriorating slowly. Her body simply wasn't doing what she wanted it to do. And he was very concerned about her being left alone at a pottery and what it meant for her. It came at a time when the Penguin History was off to the publisher and he took the news quite relatively calmly and had a determination that he was going to do everything he could to beat it. He knew it was an aggressive cancer and that it was lodged in the larynx, that in order to fight it, beat it, he might have to lose his voice and he was prepared to do that to have more life. King had just climbed his personal peak, writing for Jeff Walker, his old pal at Penguin, a major and highly readable history of New Zealand. It was absolutely critical that it be readable and accessible, that it be a single volume by one author, that it be the story of Aotearoa or New Zealand. And uh, he knew what he was doing and he tackled it in that way. And it's the, um, it's the consummation of his, of his writing, it's the consummation of his history. I'm interested in the whole of New Zealand history, Maori history, Pākehā history, I'm interested in the history of Scottish New Zealanders, Irish New Zealanders and so on. <clears throat> all those stories have been canvassed and all those elements in the story um, are there. The sales have been absolutely astonishing, which he loved of course. Um, it meant a hell of a lot to him that tens of thousands of New Zealanders were buying the book and reading it. Behind the runaway sales, King's battle with cancer brought family in close. We're very grateful to the cancer. From that point of view, it gave us all a chance to tell both he and Maria how much we loved them and to affirm the importance of family and the relationship that we'd had. At a pootery, King counted every day as a good one. The kids came and granddaughter Pippi. We spent last Christmas with them at Opotary and because we knew he had been sick we uh, there was a poignancy to the time there and yeah we had we had a really lovely particular picnic that day. The day we had a picnic with him at Christmas was 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 him um, you know out in his boat with his family in his favourite place mm. beautiful day he just, you know, he just lay back in the grass and just, you know, looked quite happy to just sit there and absorb it all and... Mm. Mm. 
But chilly winds were blowing again, and this time they came from a politician. Don Branch arrived at the Oriwa Rotary Club with a message pitched to a much wider audience. We should not use the treaty as a basis for creating greater civil, political or democratic rights for Māori than for any other New Zealander. In the 21st century, it is surely unconscionable for us to be taking that separatist path. The country was on fire with the race issue. The old wound had been torn open and King was outraged. He was appalled. He was appalled by its cynical opportunism and its, its uh, catering to unhelpful views and emotions. He made that quite clear publicly. Uh, it has to be said that he was also concerned about some aspects of Maori claims, of what he saw, what he saw as potentially frivolous claims under the treaty and of extreme claims. He was concerned about that as well. So he saw that there had to be a middle way. He did not think that the Don Brash way was the way to go, to roll, to roll everything back 30 years. I mean, context is everything. If you don't understand the context of history, you don't understand New Zealand current affairs. For a historian, the one thing that's good news about this current dispute is that it proves that history is now and is New Zealand. You know, Eliot said in the Four Quartets, history is now and is England. Well, history is now and is New Zealand because everything that's happening now is a product of our history. And if you understand our history, you can understand what's happening now without being threatened or frightened by it. I wouldn't have been surprised that with his health improving, I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd found himself taking more of a role. I'm not quite sure what I mean by this, but I think that he could have written a book on it or he could have done something that would have would have had a political effect. There was comfort in rewards and recognition, the Prime Minister's award, and bad news with the illness and then death of King's adored subject, Janet Frame. A little over two weeks ago, something extraordinary occurred in and to New Zealand. A writer died, and it seemed as if the whole country held its breath and then let out a collective sigh. By late February, the news that a pootery couldn't be better. The cruel cancer treatments had worked. The penguin history was rolling towards its eventual 100,000 plus sales. And Michael and Maria were off on holiday. A thank you from a grateful publisher. something very, very important has been lost, probably far more so than we realise. I think really Michael became an unofficial ambassador for race relations as a Pākehā. And I think perhaps looking back, that may be his greatest legacy to us. We cannot afford to lose a person like Michael who was so constantly looking at that bigger picture all the time. Who is there to continue that work? We have lost an enormously generous person, a very fine storyteller and a great New Zealander. I remember the feel of his beard, you know, when I gave him a kiss and a hug and the smell of his jersey and I remember his love and generosity and, and just enjoying being with him. I feel blessed by the adventures that we had together. Because of what he gave me, I'll always see him in the sea and in the birds and in the trees, and in the wonderful gift he gave us of all his books. I feel very lucky, but I'll miss him. It might be appropriate to read something of Dad's, and this is from Being Pākehā. The most profound satisfactions are to be found in living a life in accord with the natural world, exercising the human capacity for friendship and altruism, engaging in creative and purposeful activity, and experiencing an allegiance to one's origins. In the rise of the mist from the estuary and the fall of the rain, in the movements of the incoming and outgoing tides, I see a reflection of the deepest mystery and the most sustaining pattern of all in life, that of arrival and departure, 
of death and regeneration. And seeing them, I feel satisfaction. I'm thankful that this piece of earth exists and we upon it. To see and to experience these things, and thanks to the miracle of human consciousness, to know that we experience them.